Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Chris Timmel. I want to welcome you all to the, I don't know what episode this is, uh, but this is the, the Puzzle Pieces webcast series where uh, I finagle really interesting people to come in and have conversations uh, with me that I like to share uh, with our, our, our clients, our centers of influence, our employees. Um, uh, just interesting people to talk to, find out things out, learn things about leadership, law, you you name it. Uh, you'll find it here on the uh, on the, the the puzzle pieces webcast. Um, I, uh, I and speaking of friends uh, that I finagled to uh, to join me, I got my my good friend Todd Capone here. We'll talk a little bit about Todd in a second. Um, but before we get started, I uh, just want to let you all know. Like obviously, we're, we're recording the webinar. Um, you can use the uh, the chat function or the, the Q&A function actually would be better. So if you could just if you've got a question for, for Todd or, or for me or for whomever, or just a general question, just go ahead and pop that into the uh, into the Q&A box and uh, and we will try and uh, try and get your your questions, uh, your questions answered uh, here during the uh, during the webcast. Um, so with that, with that said, I am really am delighted to be joined by best-selling author and award-winning award winning sales leader, Todd Capone. Uh, Todd and I uh, met a few years back. We were both doing some work for, uh, for LinkedIn. Uh, uh, Todd, uh, we, we met, we hit it off. Todd gave me some great advice that I did not take. Uh, and every time I see him on LinkedIn, I, I remind him of the advice that I did not take. Uh, and uh, as we were putting these, um, as, I was put, as we were putting together uh, the pieces webcast series, I thought, you know, who would be great would be uh, would be Todd. And Todd just has a, a, a Todd's a, has a new book out, uh, The Transparent Sales Leader, uh, which is great. Uh, ten out of ten would recommend. Uh, and uh, so I thought, what a great time to have Todd on and. Uh, Talk a little bit about uh, you know talk a little bit about a lot of things. So Todd, welcome. Oh man, it's good to see you. Uh, thanks for having me, and I can't wait to get nerdy with everybody. <laughs> well, we had a couple of questions come in. And by the way, for the audience, you know, I, I think I put it in the LinkedIn post. We're not going to be there's there's not going to be a bunch of uh, a bunch of slides. As a matter of fact, there will be no slides. We will not have any slides at all. Um, so there are not going to be any slides. We're just going to we're just going to talk about stuff and riff on things, and hopefully, um, you will uh, you'll get something uh, out of it. Um, when we put out the in when we put out the invitation to the webinars, we we said, hey, do you have any any questions? And as Todd and I were talking yesterday, we were kind of framed as we do last minute. Let's frame up the the conversation. Um, we just thought, hey, you know what? The, let's just these questions in this order are exactly what we want to talk about. Right. So, so thank you to those of you who uh, who sent us who sent us the questions. Um, it, you will recognize them because we're gonna we're gonna ask them and answer them here. So, um, so and the first question I thought was I thought about this all night actually, Todd. Right? Are great leaders born or built? So you're the guest. What do you think? Yeah, it's such a funny question. You know, you so often see like our salespeople born or made and like all that. And I'm a I'm a nerd for uh, history of sales. Like when cool people are doing cool things on the weekends, you'll find me reading like an old 1905 sales magazine. I've got a whole collection of them. And they were arguing about that back then. I, you know, there's a couple of things. First, I think you got to know that leadership is in you. Like that was always my thing. I always joked that I was like a B, B minus sales rep. Like I was all right. Like I, I hit my quota, right? But I always knew in my heart that sales leadership was my thing. And for all of you that have moved into leadership, there's really two things to think about. Number one is, you know, when you're an individual contributor, it's the ultimate independent role. When you move into leadership, it's the ultimate dependent role, right? It's like 180 degrees from what you're used to. And so for me, and it's one of the things that I want to kind of lay out for everybody here is I moved into leadership, like most exciting day of my life. And then 48 hours later, I'm like, wait, I used to have a process or a structure. Now I feel like I'm a dog chasing a car down the street every day as a leader. Like, I don't know if all of you feel that, but Every morning I wake up and it's like, all right, what direction is the car going? 
that there's a personnel issue. There's a deal issue. I got a forecast to do. I got a one-on-one -on -one. like, Oh crap. And I found that like, I never knew, like sometimes I kind of get close to catching up the car, then it would turn like, Oh crap. And so when we talk about that idea of, are we born or made? The short answer is it's a combination of the two. You've got to have an inherent desire to want to lead and to want to drive people and make people's lives better and put them basically over yourself. But number two is without a structure or a process, you're going to be the dog chasing the car down the street. The, the book, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but it's this idea that I actually created a structure for sales leadership, something I could use to plan and communicate, strategize. And when the crap starts flying, I always had that to fall back on. And, and that's how I believe that I became made. But all of you, just with a simple structure, you'll be 98% ahead of the rest of the leadership world. So the, the short answer is it's a combination of the two, uh, but you got to have it in you. Yeah, I remember, I remember my first sales management job, right? Do you remember your first sales management job? I, I, yeah, like, like it was yesterday. <laughs> it, I was, uh, it was, uh, I took over a team in Queens, New York. I, I was 26, right? And like, everyone was older than me. And, you know, I was like, you know, I'm the great salesperson. I'm going to come in and show you guys how to do it. And uh, yeah, that was, that had like my, my success or, you know, as a salesperson had nothing to do <laughs> with what I was doing it was what, with what I had to do as a leader, no, like nothing at all. Oh, exactly. I mean, for me, like when I first got promoted, um, and, and we'll talk about the structure here because I want to give it to everybody, but because yeah. you could literally like once you internalize it, you could go to sleep and you'll be ahead of everybody else. Um, but yeah, that was my experience too. I got promoted. I, I had been a peer of everybody and then suddenly I was leading them and I was the youngest of everybody that I was leading. Like some of these individuals were 10, 20 years older and had a ton of experience. And so like lesson number one for everybody here is I remember my CEO was like, hey, Todd, like you got to get to it. Like you're, you're too friendly. You got to, you got to like get after people. Right. And I, I knew that was not part of who I was. And literally, I think my CEO was mad at me at the time, but saw the magic in it. I had communicated to everybody. I was like, listen, I'm no better than any of you. We are equals. We are peers. We just have different responsibilities right? Your responsibility. So as a sales leader, your responsibility is to, you know, to go generate revenue for the business that's sustainable and create advocates for us in our organization. My responsibility is to make that as easy as possible for you to clear the runway of all the crap that stands in front of you and be the reporter and the person that forecasts the business and clears the space and make sure that you have the resources to do what you do best every day. So always remember that. We are peers, but we just have a different set of responsibilities. And once we all understood that, and it wasn't like, oh, big old Todd here, look at the boss. Like once we threw that in the garbage, I had a team of people that were running behind me and it was just like a simple message, but it's also a mindset, right? Yeah. That sales leadership is not about driving re revenue. It, the revenue is the outcome if you're doing it right. That, I mean, that, that's that that's spot on right and that that gets to that gets to the uh the whiteboard that you have behind you as well yeah. right like your process which i love well exactly exactly so i'll take everybody through this um and it's simple right like i said i was a dog chasing a car down the street and i'm way too much of a nerd for that like i just i couldn't handle it and so i got in front of a whiteboard and said all right as a leader and this is a revenue leader so sales <clears throat> it applies for uh <clears throat> excuse me, um, marketing leaders, client success, leader, like whatever leadership you're in, you can, and like your CEO, you're running an early stage tech company or early stage company of any sort. Your responsibilities to maximize revenue capacity all fall into one of five categories. All right. And so those five here, I'll lay them out for you. Your first responsibility initially, but always ongoing is to focus. Right, and by focus, I mean your team, those people that report to you and work for you and work in your organization. Their most valuable asset that they have 
to turn into revenue is their time, right? And once they lose it, they never get back. Your responsibility as a revenue leader is to make sure that they're focusing their time on the right things, the right opportunities, like the right firmographics, the right demographics, the right companies, uh, vertical sizes, geos, the right individuals, the right levels, all of that. Your first initial and ongoing responsibility is to focus. Number two then, initially and ongoing, is to build the field, the team that uh, focuses on that focus, right? It, it's got to be in that order too initially, but you build your team. So the right people in the right places with the right tools and the right resources. You as a leader have a responsibility to that. Establish and maintain the focus and then build a field to attain that focus, right? The right people, right tools, right resources. So that's number two. Number three, your initial and ongoing responsibility is to the fundamentals. You need to make sure that that team is doing the right things right consistently, right? Like if it's sales, it's messaging, it's positioning, it's prospecting, discovery, qualification, proposing, negotiating. You've got a responsibility as a leader to make sure the team does those things right. Your fourth responsibility is to the forecast, right? Who knew? You've got a responsibility to predict the future. And that's not only the deals and the future revenue, but it's also the metrics and the KPIs, knowing what to measure so you see the holes before they form. And then your fifth responsibility, always arguably the cheesiest, but also maybe the most important, is fun. And when I say fun, I'm talking about culture. You as a revenue leader have a responsibility to create a culture where your team is intrinsically inspired to do their best every day, to stay, and to advocate for you, your company, your organization, and your solutions, right? So those are the five. You, you probably can't think of any other responsibility as a revenue leader that does not come into establishing and maintaining focus, building a team, a field to maintain, like go after that focus with the right tools and right resources, get the right things right consistently, predict the future through a forecast and create culture. All of those things together are your responsibility. You internalize those. And I swear, as soon as Chris, you and I get done, if all of you take 20 minutes and just write them down on a piece of paper, you could literally have a 30, 60, 90 day plan ready in a half an hour. Like it's, how are we doing on these things? Where are the opportunities for us to get better? What's the plan to do something about them? You never have to like send a note to all your buddies going, hey, anybody have a good template for a 30, 60, 90 day plan? Like you don't have to ask that anymore because you got it, right? And like, that's that's where it starts. That, that's Well, first of all, um, so I'm gonna call BS on you, right? Um, because this is not like that, that, that framework, it, it's, that can be used for any leadership. I, I don't care whether you're a sales leader or a, a coach on a baseball team or hell, a parent. Right? You can right. That. Yes, like that, that's my that's your parenting framework. That's awesome, Don. Yeah, and it's so easy. And so, you know, I used it for all my planning and strategizing, but I ended up using it for all my communications. Right. So whether it was an all hands meeting, right? I would take everybody through like, here's, here's where our focus is. Here's updates of the team. Here's the things we're trying to get better at. Uh, here's our forecast, the numbers, and here's some cool stuff that we're doing, right? But I would use it for one-on-ones. So my one-on-one -on -one with my CEO, this was the structure every week. We always start with fun and you can do it with all your direct reports. Mm -hmm. Start with the fun, right? The culture building. But then the, like if your one-on-ones as a sales leader are only about the forecast, you might be doing it wrong. Um, I also used it down, right? So my direct reports all came to my one-on-ones. This was always the agenda and they would collect things during the week. I used it for when I interviewed for roles, made me sound smart and I could use all the help I could get. Um, board meetings, I would walk into a board meeting and like my CEO would be like, all right, Todd, you know, time for the sales update. And uh, like the, the you know, I would say to the group, all right, like everybody ready? And they're like, oh, let me guess. It's the F and 5S again. Like, of course it is. But that meant that like my board used it themselves and they always knew that I had all the holes covered. I used it for due diligence, like looking to acquire companies. There was one company that when I was on the uh, sales leadership team at Exact Target, we had acquired two companies at once, uh, Pardot and Igo Digital. 
they asked me to do the due diligence on Igo after we bought them because it was kind of a small kind of throw in acquisition. Like, Todd, what do we got? Pull out the five Fs. You got it. I'm telling you, you'll stand out ahead of everybody else. It you makes you sound really smart, but you will be smarter because you'll always have a plan. That, that, that is, that's fantastic. Focus, uh, focus, field, fundamentals, forecast, and fun. Even I can remember that. <laughs> uh, but um, but what's, what's really interesting, though, is, is the, the last F, fun, really does, in a lot of ways, segment to question number two. Yeah. And by the way, for the audience, um, again, if, you, if you've got questions or comments, just go ahead and pop them into the, into the Q&A, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to get to those. Um, for you, but it really gets to, to question number two, and that is, uh, what is the biggest challenge in managing a remote workforce and maintaining employee engagement, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's funny, um, there's a couple of things there. So like in the book, the first section walks through the structure and gives you real tactical ways that you can go optimize each one. Section two is all about the science of intrinsic inspiration, which is what I call it, but it's this idea that like if you believe your sales reps are coin operated, you're right if you're doing it wrong. Yeah, I, that, I, I will tell you what, that is the, I hate that phrase so much. Yeah. Sales reps, I remember, I remember the first time I heard it, we had gotten a new vice president at, uh, at another place that I worked, a uh, new senior vice president. And, and uh, we were sitting in a hotel, uh, so we were just meeting and, and he said that, you know, sales reps are you know, coin operated machines. And like any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of credence or anything that, that I, you know, any sort of, I don't say respect, but you know, anything, any, that, that eroded any sort of positivity that I could have possibly had in my relationship with that individual. So, well, yeah, it, your responsibility under this fun bucket is you want to create an environment where variable compensation is the reward for doing work you love to do instead of the reason you do it. Like that's just look across at organizations, right. That are really, really successful. And so to your point about the remote environment, like how do you keep people engaged? You know, it's funny to look at since March of 2020. I mean, it was literally a case study in intrinsic inspiration. And here's what I mean. We went from an environment where all the reps are in an office all the time, or your team's in an office all the time. All of a sudden, everybody had to go home, right? And so everybody's remote. Now you had this kind of yin and yang of leaders needing control and predictability with reps wanting their independence, right? And so how do you manage those two things? Well, it was funny to watch the first couple of months where a lot of leaders were like, hey, we're gonna do twice daily check-ins. Um, like we're gonna start the day with the motivation and see what you're gonna accomplish. And at the end of the day, uh, we're gonna see how you did, right? And that was just a Petri dish for lots. Um, like, you know, your rep in the morning would go, all right, what can I say I'm gonna accomplish today? So I don't sound like a brown nose, but I sound like I'm working hard. At the end of the day, it's like, all right, what BS can I come up with to cover my butt for the fact that I didn't do anything today? I like that was funny. But then we decided to over uh, index on this idea of what is security, pack building, uh, family, relatedness. All of a sudden, leaders were starting to recognize that, hey, listen, these reps are not feeling like they're a part of the team anymore because they're sitting at their homes all by themselves. Let's over index on that. Let's do Zoom happy hours every night or every Thursday night. You know, we'll do a costume contest. Like, oh God. But we, we had to do it. Like it was a good thing because we had to try, try to bring things, people together. Here was the thing though. We, we failed uh, to move on to anything else. And that like shameless back padding here, I don't do much of it, but I predicted the great resignation before it happened. And here's why. There was, came a time where the physical cost of changing jobs became non-existent, right? Meaning physically, if I wanted to change jobs, I don't have to change my commute. You send me a new laptop and maybe a pair of logoed socks and here we go, right? That's the physical cost. The emotional cost disappeared too, because for the most part, you hadn't even met your coworkers before, right? Video could never replace the connection that you have with actually being in the trenches with the individuals, going to actual happy hours and lunches and coffee and seeing each other you know, around the city. As a result, no physical cost to change, no emotional cost. So your triggers 
to leave were almost nothing. Like, uh, hey, we're raising your quota. All right, see ya. Unplug, plug in somewhere else. Territory got smaller. All right, see ya. Um, I just lost a deal and I don't like my pipeline. I'm getting out of here when the going's good. I, I just went and I was talking to a buddy of mine who's making a ton of money with the company and they love it there and they're hiring. See ya. I believe that the reason the great resignation happened is because we had a bunch of leaders out there too who had that old mindset, Chris, like you talked about, which is when a rep wakes up in the morning, if they believe their purpose in life is to hit their quota, hit their targets, right? Close deals. They can do that anywhere. That the missed opportunity, and I wish, I, I want all of you to think about this, is the companies that succeeded and kept the great resignation at bay were the ones that were really good at making sure that their reps knew what their aim was, their mission, the purpose of their work, the impact that they're making, not only on your company, but on your customers and on their customers, right? Because that is unique to your company and it can't just be replaced somewhere else. And I'll give you a quick example. We can talk about it. Like my last role, I was the chief revenue officer of a company called Power Reviews. We were in the review space. We helped retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website. Who gives a crap? Well, you know who gives a crap? The consumer at the end who's using those reviews to make really smart purchase decisions with their hard-earned money, which during the pandemic or anything else, was hard to come by, right? We were helping make families' lives better and make, help them make better purchase decisions by helping retailers and brands collect and display authentic, true reviews that they could use to make decisions for themselves. Once my team really felt that, their job wasn't about hitting their target. Their job was about helping families, right? And we created nerds, like review nerds. I had a couple of reps that are like, you know, like I joked about at the beginning about me reading sales history, we had a couple of reps that are like on the weekends are reading up on like consumer behavior and reviews, right? Because they cared about what we did. I think all of you, everybody listening has got an opportunity. Do you think your team members know what their work means to your customers? And even more important, do you think your team knows what their work means to your customers' customers? And once that triggers and it's unique and they care, that's how you drive engagement in a remote environment or really any environment where your team stays, does their best and advocates. And, and that, that's that's great, you know, because, and you think about it, right? The role of a leader, the way I see it is to create and maintain a motivating environment where people want to do the work necessary to reach their individual potential. And in doing that, right, it helps the company reach its potential and the company's customers and their customers, right? So, I mean, you, you really, um, you really hit the, kind of hit the nail on the head. It's funny though, you know, I'm not going to lie, um, you know, um, well, I'll tell you a story. So then, then I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> so, so when we started, when we started Puzzle back in 2019, we, and I am here in our physical office, um, but uh, here in Tampa, when we started the company in 2019, we started the company and it, it was, we had designed everything to be remote. Like we don't need this office at all. Uh, it's a it's a pretty sizable space. I think there's two other people in here today. Um, but we designed the, we designed the entire business model to be, uh, you know, hybrid or distributed, right? We have, we have employees. We had all employees all around the country when we started, um, you know, and we have employees really all around the country and around the world now, um, you know, just, just, just three years later. So, um, you know, we had obviously, so we had to stack up the technology to make sure that that was, that that was there, um, that we could actually do that. Um, but the engagement piece, and, and this is, you know, 2019 and we had to, you know, we had to drag, uh, we, we, we had to all claw through, you know, starting a business and, and clawing through COVID together. And I will tell you that what got us from there to here as a as a collective, all us, all us puzzlers, um, is that uh, is that sense of a combined purpose, a sense of a combined mission, right? To really um, drive business results for our customers through the human resources discipline of, of strategy and tactics. So, yeah, yeah. so that, and that, that really did kind of hit home for, for me at least. 
Yeah, dude, that's a great like example of that, right? And the companies that have been most successful through all of this are the ones that created that purpose and that mission. Now, I will, there's, there's one other thing that I just thought about that I, I'm thinking about the question that was asked. And I wonder if uh, any of the attendees here are, are thinking about this right now. Um, I've been looking at a lot of the behavioral science around, all right, there's companies that are saying, hey, everybody come back, right? And there's some that are like, no, the future is remote. And like, there's this balance of that. My advice for everybody is don't just let it happen, right? Like be intentional because there's two mm -hmm. things that I've seen happening um, that I just, I wanna make sure that you're all aware of and thinking about. Number one is this idea of distance bias. I see these individual companies that are saying, hey, if you wanna come back, come back. And if you don't, cool right? Like we're going to support you either way, which is great, right? Super flexible. However, I then see a few months later that when promotion opportunities come up, leaders are leaning towards the person that they know, the person that's in the office, the person that they feel confident is going to be the best leader for them because they're just connected to them emotionally and physically because they're in the office with them and that we're creating career path issues for the people that stay remote. Pay attention to that one, number one. Number two is this idea for these companies, all of you that had in office and then you moved remote and now you're trying to bring everybody back to in office. Realize this, there's this, I, this, this concept and it's, it's called like expectation inflation, but regardless what happens in your organization, your team, gets to a, a new expectation about what reality is. And so they were paying for their commute, right? They were losing a half an hour each way, hour each way, dealing with commute. All of a sudden they're remote, they love it, great, cool. And then we're like, hey, we're just gonna go back to the way we were. That expectation inflation means, hey, listen, I'm used to having a little bit more money in my pocket, a little more gas in my tank that doesn't cost so much, right? And now, you're asking me to come back. You're actually taking money out of my pocket to force me to come back in the office. What are we doing for those people? Like, how are we realizing that now they feel like they're having something taken away by being forced to come back in the office? So those two things, distance bias from a career pathing perspective, and think about the idea of expectation inflation that your team, even though you used to do it, they had a new expectation and now you're taking something out of their pocket to bring them back. Solve for those two issues. I think you're going to find a surprising number of people will want to come back to the office and will want to be around people instead of their annoying roommates. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, we, we, so we do this weekly, um, weekly newsletter uh, that goes out to all our clients and our, um, and our partners in the field. Uh, and then a, a monthly, um, a monthly blog post. And I know we recently, it was probably a month and a half ago, uh, we wrote a, uh, there's a, we, we wrote a piece on distance bias. And, oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, because it is, we did, we didn't call it distance bias, uh, but we are, we will when we, uh, when we write the next blog post about the next <laughs> jigsaw about that. Um, but uh, yeah, we absolutely just wrote a, wrote a piece, uh, wrote a piece recently on that. I think it'll, it'll probably make it to a, um, uh, to a, to a blog post in, uh, in, in another month or so. Um, so I'm, I, I got a question for the audience. All right, audience, you're there, right? Let's. Uh, we already missed. I, you know, I missed an opportunity to say, "Hey, audience, do you think great? Do you think leaders are born or built?" Uh, I would love to hear what the audience says now. They're you know now that they know the answer to the question. <laughs> but um, but so it's a little, maybe a little fun. How many of you here in the audience have either uh, ha attended or uh, or mandated a uh, Zoom happy hour? <laughs> just go ahead and just go ahead and chat it in. Put it in the chat. Uh, I I see some I see a lot. I see some hands going up. <laughs> we we had a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, had a couple of had a couple. We have a, a few few out there. I we had a few here at uh, at Puzzle. And it was um, necessary. You know, I mean, it was something that we had to do. It was a good thing for a while. I just was looking. You know, before the Great Resignation, going. You know, we're like 15 months into this thing and we're still doing Zoom happy hours and we haven't plugged that hole of the other pieces. Like people are still leaving, even though we're doing these and we sent them a Yeti cooler. Like, why are they leaving? Like, I, it's, I, it was just a miss because we weren't really thinking through all of the elements that contribute to intrinsic inspiration.
Yeah, no, it's, it's gosh, it's, it, you know, managing a, a remote, uh, a remote workforce is just, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's really difficult. I, I, I find that I, I, I would make a statement. I'm curious to your opinion, right? I, I'm finding that there is some, we'll call it generational angst, right? Right. That, uh, that, that generation of, of managers and leaders who are used to, um, you know, being in the office and learning over folks and, you know, seeing people come in and if they leave at 501, you know, they, you know they, and have those thoughts and concepts and feel, but the ones that will, will, will tell prey to um, proximity bias, right? Um, you know, I feel like it, it's kind of that, um, that group that's having the, the struggling the most with um, managing folks remotely or the transition to the new hybridized, uh, hybridized environment. You see the same thing or? Yeah, and it's funny, I'm also seeing the flip side of that. You know, um, what's amazing to me is, you know, if you look at uh, 2017 to 2020, we had very steady economic growth, right? It was, it was solid, it was, you know, fine. We had a short-term shutdown in March, April, May of like, the whole economy in March of 2020. And then we came out of it with the biggest spike that we've ever seen in terms of, uh, you know, like new unicorns, for example, like that four year period before 2020, 21, we, we saw 567 newly minted unicorns, which are companies that based on their investment are now worth a billion. In 2021 alone, we had 587. So more than the previous four years combined. What that means is that we promoted a lot of people in the leadership during that period a lot of people that had no experience that this is their first leadership job. And when I say the flip side, I'm saying that right now as we're trying to bring people in, you probably have a, like, you know, if you see across the landscape, there's a lot of leaders out there that have never led a team in the office. Never. They've only known remote. They don't even know how to treat people and how they're going to act in an office, right? Like, what are they going to do when they leave at 501? Like, is that cool? Like, yep, they have no idea. And so that's why a lot of this, this like there's this training gap for, uh, for revenue leadership where these individuals don't know and don't know like how to balance out the things that inspire us. And so, yeah, you've got both sides, right? But you've never managed remote, how do you do it? Well, a lot of us were forced to get that experience. What's gonna be more interesting is I've never managed people in an office, how am I gonna do that, right? And that's coming. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, too, you know, to that point, we have a we have kind of a question I'll, I'll hit you with. Yeah, I, we have a, like, I, I've interviewed, uh, I interviewed uh, someone recently uh, for an analyst role and uh, to, to work on our, uh, and to work on the enablement side of the house. And, uh, and one of my questions, do you have any questions for me? And, uh, and he said, I do have one. What's it like working in an office? I go, what do you mean? He's like, you know, like in an office with people. Right? <laughs> and I was flabbergasted and uh, until he explained, I've never worked in an office. I've, I've none, and nor have any of my friends. All of my jobs have always been remote. And I was, I was like blown away by that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like, I mean, it, it, it's a leadership gap, right? That like a lot, I mean, the, the, there's the bulk of leaders have never been trained in uh, revenue leadership or sales leadership. And there's a big chunk that have never actually managed people in an office before. And so like now is the time to kind of figure that stuff out too. That's that's a whole. Yeah, no, absolutely. So so we have a question from, from Noah uh, who says, who asks if you can speak about the generational workforce opinions to your leadership model. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing about the five Fs is it doesn't matter if you've been leading for 25 years or if it's your first leadership job. And uh, I've actually coached a couple of uh, reps that are looking to move into leadership and just like, you know, internalize the five Fs. And when you get that question, you're ready, right? Like when you get the question, like, how do you think about leadership and your role and your responsibility? Well, hey, I've got a structure. Here's the way that I think about it. You're going to sound really, really smart there. Now, the, the generational elements of all of this, I've been researching a lot recently around um, the, the, the people that say that the future of business is all going to be remote, right? Because like, I don't quite buy that, but it's funny, I, being the sales history nerd that I am, that 
a hundred years ago, there was an article in Sales Management Magazine in 1921 that talked about this idea that your salespeople are the loneliest people on the planet because they're all remote and they're never seeing anybody. And all they do is they're on the road and they're in different hotels and they're taking trains from town to town. And how horrible is that, right? Well, we went from there to everybody is remote um, in, in the office or like at their homes and everything. And like, how do we bring people back and do we? And what I found is interesting is like, I made that joke about trying to get away from your annoying roommates. I'm finding that a lot of the younger generation, you know, not married, no kids yet, they want to go back to the office, right? Like they want to get back in there and be around people every day. They're spending the majority of their, their working lives, right? Work, like they're working eight, 10 hours a day with the commute and all that. And they're doing it all by themselves and they want to be around people. So I think that's going to be really interesting to see the different generations and how badly they're going to want to come back versus being remote. Are we going to see the, the family people want to stay remote and the, the, the younger generation and those people that are more independent want to come back to the office? I think that'll be really interesting to see. And then leaders are going to have to adjust accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. I think we just need to Myers-Briggs everybody. And uh <laughs> Yeah, and that'll that that'll you, if you if you have a business, just Myers Briggs everybody, and that'll tell you how much uh, square footage you need. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and Malia put a comment in here saying, "I believe it's more about managing total output and not the people." And yeah, like it's like you read the book um, that like revenue leadership, the the output is you know it. It's the result of creating a culture where your team is inspired to do their best work every day and that you're managing each one of these pieces. So you make sure that their time is spent appropriately, uh, that they've got the right tools and resources and that they're learning and they're getting better at what they do, right? Like you manage those things together and the output is going to be a natural extension of creating a culture where the team wants to perform and giving them the tools to do their best work. So I, I'm with you there. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Any any other questions from the uh, from the audience? And thanks for that one, Melly and Noah. I'll just go ahead and, and pop them in the pop them in the Q and A. We'll kind of we'll kind of uh, hop on them here. Thirty eight after hour. The last the the last question that we got kind of pre um, uh, you know pre webcast was to talk through some evaluation best practices. Yeah, so, I, yes, like evaluation best practices, and I, I'll um, I'll, I'll tell you just a quick story about something that happened to me. And like, I, I stole this idea from somebody else, by the way, but I like, after I heard it, I was like, oh my gosh, I remember when this happened. I'm like, I'm just a believer. And I know you are too, Chris, that evaluation is not an event, right? Like evaluation and feedback, like feedback is part of this idea of creating a culture and of intrinsic inspiration. That the story I was going to tell you was uh, the one where I had taken a new role as a CRO. Um, my CEO and I had different philosophies though, right? I like to think I'm a nice guy, right? I'm a good dude, but he and I were going after each other. And he knew that like this was gonna work if he and I could just get on the same page. So we have a one-on-one. -on -one. It's like December of whatever year it was. I'm sitting in his office waiting for him. He's a couple minutes late. He shows up, he's like out of breath. He's like, Todd, I. I just spent the last hour at a Starbucks and I made a list of the 10 things I love about you and what you do. And then I made a list of the 10 things that I don't, that I wish you'd get better at. And I was like, this is going to be hell on earth. Like this is going to be a nightmare, isn't it? And sure enough, like he went through these 10 glowing things and then he just tore me up uh, for like for 20 minutes about the things I had to get better at. I walked out of that not remembering the 10, just remembering that I was pissed, right? And so when I say that I, I took this model from somebody else, it, it's, I think it's called like the one, 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 one model. But for every coaching moment, four questions that you can ask. Number one question is to the individual, like let's say it's me coaching you, Chris. I might say, hey, Chris, um, what's one thing that you think you did really, really well? And you'll share. And then I go, here's one thing I think you did really, really well. And then the third one is, what's one thing that you wish you would have done better or you think you need to work on? Get your opinion first. And then I share, here's one thing that I saw that I think is an opportunity for you to improve. You got to focus on one at a time. 
right? Because otherwise it becomes this beating and nobody walks out of that feeling good and it becomes a coaching moment. But to get the opinion and the idea of the individual first on them, because it's funny, sometimes I had had conversations like that where I'm like, what's one thing you think you did really, really well? Turns out to be the one thing that I think is an opportunity for you to, to do better, right? And without knowing that, you're, there's a resistance. And now I've got context and you can get really, really coach, or really, really good at coaching. So from a performance perspective, it's got to be ongoing. It's got to be constant, um, but one thing at a time and do positive and negative. And it, it, you'll, you'll find that the fruits of that and the results that come out of that type of coaching is so much more positive. Uh, that, that's good stuff. That, that's good stuff. I, I actually use a similar approach when I interview, but, um, but let's talk about that value. So we're so, so, so are you like an annual review guy? You're a quarterly review guy? Like what, what, what's your, I know the answer, so, but I got to throw it out there. Well, yeah, I mean, it's basically, um, there's really three components to feedback, right? And like, there's this element of, you know, we as human beings do our best work when there's recognition available. Right, like when we get recognized for our efforts, and there's really three categories within that. There's validation, which is, hey, I appreciate the work that you're doing. Like, thanks for showing up. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, it used to be like, you're lucky you have a job. But like in today's world, it's like the validation is, thanks for showing up. The second part is status, which is, are there opportunities for us to recognize um, efforts, performance in a way that is viewed by other people so that other people can see. And that could be titles, that could be awards, it could be, you know, name on a plaque, whatever it happens to be. And then that third category is feedback. And like I said, I'm a believer that feedback needs to happen constantly and in the moment. I don't believe in quarterly reviews, semi-annual, annual. I don't believe in any of that, but that's just me. It never worked for me because it became an event and it became a laundry list. Mm -hmm. When and as a leader, right, and as a leader, if you're doing like it, it's as so for the for the person that's receiving the annual review or whatever, right, it's not positive for them. And yeah. as the leader, it's not positive for you because you gotta you have to pretend to have remembered a whole year's worth of stuff for right. that, that one meeting. Yeah. And you know, you you're just you're you're hitting them on the, the the what what they either did or didn't do in these last you know three weeks or four weeks leading up to the meeting. Yeah, that was never valuable for me. I'll tell you one funny story. Um, my, my first tech job out of college was with a company called CA, Computer Associates. Oh, yes. Like CA was affectionately required, uh, known as creative accounting, if you know the story there too. But um, that's a side joke. Uh, but they used to do this thing, like it used to be a beating. Um, like that environment was terrible. I don't, I, I'm hoping it's a lot better now. That was like 20 plus years ago. But they would do annual uh, reviews and let's say there was, there, I think at one point there was 33 people on my team. They would give you your review. And apparently the leaders were not allowed to put anything positive in it so that you couldn't take it and go use it to get another job. And the second thing is they would rank you from one to 33. But if you were in the top third, you'd just get an X so that you couldn't actually take that and use it to get another job either. It was crazy. I mean, like that's some old school crap, but like, you know, blessed that I used to finish with an X. I was X of 33. And then it was like, um, I, I don't even remember what the feedback was because it was dumb. But um, like, that's not the way to drive intrinsic inspiration where your team stays, does their best and wants to talk about a great yard to everybody. Yeah, <laughs> just you're, you're reminding me of, of an of a annual review that I got one time uh, where I was, uh, you know, as a sales leader and, uh, and I was like number one in the country, right? And there were, and I came back and I got a shitty review. I'm like, what, what, what is this? And uh, the 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 person who gave me that review is absolutely going to uh, <laughs> listen to this webinar. Uh, but like <laughs> even even to this day, I like I I bust his chops about it. Like I'll wrap his Christmas gifts in that review from 1997 <laughs> or something like that. It was like, because I was, I was, I had one metric that I was, this immaterial metric that I was not, uh, that, that, I, that I wasn't great in because it didn't matter. And the, my whole review was around, around that, you know? Yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, for everybody, just be careful with that. I mean, again, if, if anything is a surprise to an individual, you're probably doing it wrong. 
Um, and that's why like coach in the moment, every opportunity you get, but just keep it simple one thing at a time. Yeah, yeah. We got, we got a note here from Taylor uh, who says, have you identified, or, or, or I have an opinion on this one. What, have you identified or what do you think is the key difference between a leader and a manager? That's like a really big question. Yeah. Because right, first you got to define leader and manager, but you're the guest. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I love your opinion on that too. I mean, my opinion is a leader is somebody that you want to run behind. Um, a leader is somebody who's uh, helping make your job better and you want to see them succeed too, right? Like that's, that's what leadership is. Like a manager is somebody who just manages activity and manages structure. And, like, you know, it, it, that to me is, I'm trying to think if I've had managers before and I know I have. Um, managers create environments where um, they're just like, they're focused on, your behavior and your structure and your process. And mm -hmm. I think we lose sight of our customers. I'm a huge advocate of this idea. I'll go on a quick rant here for a second. When you look to sales history's past, the early 1900s, you know, um, sales was trusted. It was respected. It was even an admired profession. It was taught in almost every university of substance in 1910. Like, I know that's crazy when people are like, why isn't sales taught in college? It used to be taught in all of them, like Wharton, Harvard, Yale, like all those. Michigan, University of Michigan, Ohio State, they all had it. It was actually taught in high schools. There was 11 Boston public high schools that were teaching sales back in the early 1910s uh, under the, the, the leadership of a woman named Lucinda W. Prince, who was like, she's awesome. Like the, the pioneer for women in the sales profession. If you ever want to nerd out on that, let me know. But we lost our face. We lost our buyer centricity back then. Why? Because back then, sales processes and sales forecasts were all about recognizing buyer behavior. They used an acronym that you might cry yourself to sleep thinking about from the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, <laughs> when Blake from Mitch and Murray, Alec Baldwin goes through AIDA. AIDA, do I have your attention? Like, is the person paying attention? Are they interested? Have we generated a desire in them and are they ready to take action? That became the basis for every sales process and every sales forecasting methodology from 1900, it was actually theorized in 1898 by Elias St. Elmo Lewis, all the way through the 1940s. And then all of a sudden we're like, nope, we're gonna make it seller-centric. We're gonna start creating seller-centric processes, You know, prospect, discovery, qualification, uh, demo, propose, close all seller-centric activities that were clearly devised by managers, not leaders. And as a result, all the endorphin rushes that our sales reps would get would be based on what they were doing instead of recognizing what the buyer was doing. We lost our face. We introduced technologies that made it really easy for us to lose our human connection to individuals. The entire sales profession eroded as a result. All the colleges threw out all of their uh, curriculum because nobody wanted to be in sales anymore. People didn't even want to interview for those jobs. And it became this world where we lost our buyer centricity and became seller centric. And I believe that was from like big company managers like IBM that are like process, process, process. Here are the steps, go, and I'm going to manage that for you instead of creating leaders that are focused on buyer outcomes. So rant completed, but I think there's a huge opportunity there. And I think it speaks to the difference between leadership and management. Yeah, no, that is, uh, first of all, you blow me, blow me. I wrote AIDA, I'm like, wait a minute, where's that from? And then I'm like, I, Alec Baldwin. Yeah, you got that one thing right, yes. <laughs> right. Um, nobody was, talks AIDA to, uh, to like today at all. You, you get your, your Salesforce instance out of the box, the forecast stages are seller centric. HubSpot seller centric, all of them seller centric. I think there's an opportunity for leaders to layer on top of those. Like you don't have to throw out your stages, but, and you don't have to go back to AIDA, AIDA either, but you can go back to this idea that we all as human beings go through three steps at least. We decide why change. So is our status quo worth changing and pursuing an alternative? The second question is then why you? versus well, like why your solution versus going another path. And then the third question is why now? Like, am I ready to sign now? And it follows AIDA exactly. And I'll argue the order with anybody on it, but all of you can do this. Layer buyer centricity over your stages, 
teach your leaders to recognize that and focus your team on driving buyer process instead of seller process, your forecast will become more accurate but you'll also build trust with your customers and differentiate in the way that you sell. Yeah, I'll tell you what, you know, I think that the three whys are, are critical. And, and, you know, when you think about, when, when you think about selling, you know, the, the biggest mistake I see salespeople make is, is they try to sell, right. To people who are not um, interested, right. I think to have a true, people aren't prospects, right. To be a true, pro, a true prospect is someone who's got the ability to buy and the willingness to listen. In other words, they want to hear, they have some level of, you have their attention and they are interested. They're not interested. Don't bother putting them in Salesforce. Right. What's the way you're never like, you're never going to, you know, the, the disc, you can do a great discovery, but it's not going to matter if they're not, in, if, if people aren't, aren't interested and you're right. You know, I mean, the, the question was the difference between a leader and a manager. Leaders lead people, right? They, they lead people. There are, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, a pastor in, in your church or you think about, you know, your, your parents or your scout troop leader or whatever, right? Or your, or your team leader, your, your, uh, your, your leader on your sports team. Like they lead people um, toward a common destination. Managers just manage processes, right? Leaders are in the front and managers are in the back, right? That's so, the way to put it, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, wanna, I wanna get back to the, the first question, are, are, great, are, are great leaders born or are they built, right? And then we're, we're kind of coming up late and so we'll kind of close up in a little bit, but like, you know, so we're all born, right? Right, so that's, we, we, everyone on the call here, we, we, we've all been born, all right? So check, check, right? And, and there's so so it, it really is kind of built how do you you can't be built and just tell me if you agree with this i i don't think a leader can be built if um if that if that person that individual doesn't really want to do the work necessary to 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 do that thing to be a leader even though they kind of everyone has it in them oh yeah that 100 percent but that, that's, there's a number of people that I know that have been in individual contributor roles for 30 years and they love it. And they wake up intrinsically inspired every single day and they've never had regrets for not moving into leadership. That's number one. The, number two is a number of people that I've seen in my career have moved into leadership because either A, that's what somebody told them they're supposed to do. Like that's the career path. Or B, they do it for the wrong reasons. So their buddies would look at them and go, oh, look at Todd, he's a leader, right? And they, they don't do it for the re right reasons, which, you know, for me, and I know it sounds cheesy and like, you're yeah, right, Todd, but like, I always was inspired by being able to teach something to somebody and watch them succeed as a result. Like, there's nothing that gives me a bigger endorphin rush than watching somebody's performance change or their career change as a result of something I helped them achieve, right? Like, that's so much cooler than, to me than going and closing a big deal. And so you've got to have that inherent in you that that's a desire that each one of us individually has. And when you do that, then you're probably cut out for leadership, but then hopefully the structure and processes and best practices are kind of optimized by science on a layer of transparency here will help you become the leader that you can be. Yeah, you know what? Well, well said, well said. Um, you know what? I, I we're we're 54 minutes in. Um, I you know Todd I had an absolute great time chatting with you today. Um, you know for for the attendees, if you want to get in touch with Todd, uh, just to geek out about 1876 uh, <laughs> processes or or, or or to engage him, uh, you know for to to work in your organization, um, go to toddcaponi.com. T O D D C A P O N I dot com, toddcaponi.com. Um, thank you, Todd, so much for joining us here on the uh, the pieces webcast. I don't know if this is the third or fourth uh, episode. I have no idea, uh, but um, but I want to thank I want to thank you for for spending the time with us today. I want to thank uh, all the folks in the audience for their questions and their participation, and uh, absolutely uh, look forward to uh, look forward to doing this again. Awesome. Thanks for having me. That was a blast. And um, you can also follow along or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you do, let me know where you heard me. But uh, this has been a blast, Chris, and I could talk to you all day, brother.
<laughs> I appreciate you, Todd. Thank you so much. Everyone, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Take good care.